That song, wonderful. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Toby. Well, what comes to your mind when you think of the power of God or Christ? The power of God or Christ. What immediately pops into your mind? Does creation? Does creation pop into your mind? You know, God spoke everything into existence in six days. The stars, the sun, the moon, the planets, solar systems, and galaxies. That's incredible power, right? God did that uh, without any help. Maybe you think about the flood, you know, Noah and the, and the ark and, and the flood of the entire world. The earth was covered with water and, and God set his king at the flood. And that's an, a demonstration of unspeakable power. We can't get our minds around that. Often people will think of uh, Jesus walking on water. You know, that's one of the miracles that even unbelievers know about. You know, it's in part of our common vo vocabulary, Jesus walking on water. I mean, that's some incredible power to not be above the water, not to sink into the water, but to just walk right on top, defying gravity. Maybe the resurrection of Christ comes to your mind when you think about the power of God or the power of Christ himself to raise someone clinically dead. Heart has been stopped for days and, 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 and shortly after, you know, later on, day four, decay is going to begin to set in and, and then God raises him physically, bodily from the dead, raises him from the grave. <clears throat> the crucified one walks out of that tomb alive forevermore. That's some serious power. We tend to gravitate toward the big and the dramatic. When we think of the power of God, we tend to think of signs and wonders that uh, God has done throughout history and throughout Scripture. We, we tend to think about these standalone acts of God where mere mortals just watch in awe, making no contribution or participation whatsoever. And granted, sometimes that is the case. But the ordinary and the normative display of the power of God is very different. Those are God's extraordinary moments. His ordinary moments is he exercises his power through human instruments. I recently saw a short video of the work that the men did at Karis Hills last uh, few weekends ago, whenever that was. And I saw a little sideshow and there was a picture of a, of a trailer where some of the staff lived and, and there was a blank wall and there were periodic pictures of the men building a deck for that for that trailer, for that young family. And, how, and then the final picture was the deck complete and they had big smiles on their face because they had a wonderful place for their little child to play and a place to enjoy fellowship. And I thought, that's a real example of what I'm talking about this morning. God could have spoken that deck into existence. And God could have snapped his uh, fingers and voila, there it was, complete. Every nail in place, ready to go. But he didn't do it that way. God built that deck through human instruments. God exercised his power through the hands and feet of the body of Christ, right? And that's one illustration of thousands along this line. God's ordinary MO then is to work in and through the very weaknesses of his people. He works in and through our humanness. God works in and through our words, our attitudes, especially when things aren't going so well, and our actions. This is God's normal means of grace. He works through our talents. He works through our gifts. He works through our experiences. And it's not as if we're doing something here and God's doing something over there. That's not how he works. He works through us as instruments in his hand. We're like gloves, and, and he's like the animating hand and the power that fills that glove, and then it operates. He does all of this, of course, through his indwelling Holy Spirit, who's also known as the Spirit of Christ. And so when we think about the power of God in Christ, we want to be thinking in terms of the power of Christ in us and speaking through us through our day-to-day -day lives. Now, all of this is certainly the case when our small little team of only four missionaries, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, show up in Philippi, a town of 10,000 people, a Roman colony in Macedonia, modern-day Europe. Uh, they, they cross the Aegean Sea, they cross a massive border of humanity, and they arrive into this leading city, Luke calls it, and they become instruments of the power of Christ, the multifaceted, 
multidimensional power of Christ through these frail, weak, flawed, broken, sinful human instruments. The title this morning is The Multifaceted Power of Christ. This is part two. The total text is Acts 16, 11 to 40 of this time in Philippi. Luke devotes a substantial amount of text to their events there because Luke loves this city. It's perhaps his home city. He was either from Troas or Philippi. Maybe he moved back and forth. And one of the things that is very subtle in this passage, the missionaries will move on from Philippi, but the team of four will become a team of three because Luke stays behind. An infant church is planted and Paul leaves Luke behind to be their first shepherd, their first pastor, no doubt, their first spiritual leader of this fledgling little flock. And then we'll see him join, rejoin them later down the road. Well, that brings me then to our sermon main idea for this entire passage, this two-part uh, little series. This passage contains five samples of the multifaceted power of Christ displayed through human instruments. And I just want you to underline that last part of that, displayed through human instruments. These stories, really, there's multiple stories here uh, that, that really point us to five examples of this multidimensional power of Christ that except for the earthquake, except for the earthquake, he, he operates this power through these human instruments. And I want to highlight that even as we review a little bit from last week. So we're looking at five. We covered three last week, two today. Number one was the power to open human hearts. If you're taking notes, I'm going to have you add a little something here. It is the power to open human hearts to respond to human words, right? It's the power of Christ to open the heart of Lydia so that she could respond to the words of Paul. We saw that last week. Lydia, this seller of purple fabrics, this woman who was a worshiper of God from Thyatira had come to Philippi to engage in business. She's successful. She's confident. She's an entrepreneur and she's listening. And, and the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, comes to her closed heart and he sovereignly, graciously opens that heart. And then as her heart is open, as her mind, emotions, and will are opened to the Lord, by the Lord, she then responds to the human words of Paul. Number two, we saw there was this slave girl who was possessed of a spirit of divination and she went around behind the missionaries kind of chanting out day after day, these men are servants of the most high God and they tell you the way of salvation. And her message was confusing because most high God could be used of Zeus and way of salvation could be salvation in Roman and Greek terms. And so Paul put up with it as long as he could. He became greatly annoyed. He turned to the girl and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. That's our second demonstration of the power of Christ, the power to defeat, stand up to and defeat demonic spirits. And this happens through one sentence, <laughs> one sentence of a human being. Number three, we saw last week, the power to sustained suffering saints, and I'll add to this one, through their faith. Through their faith. This was in 19 to 25. So after they cast out the demon spirit of this slave girl who was telling people's fortunes fraudulently, not legitimately, but people believed in it, paid her owners lots of money to have their fortune read, not unlike tarot cards today, palm reading, all of that nonsense, all of that evil. That stuff is totally evil. Stay away from it. Ouija boards, seances, black magic, all that stuff is of the devil. Don't play with it. Don't mess with it. That's what was going on here. That sort of thing. Demonic. And Paul looks at this slave girl and he, and he commands this demon to come out. And they lose their money source and he knew this would happen and so the whole city turns against Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke are spared this beating providentially sovereignty of God but also they didn't look as Jewish as Paul and Silas <laughs> well Luke wasn't Timothy was half Jewish Paul and Silas were full Jewish dressed Jewish and it so it became kind of an anti-semitism event anyway they get pronounced guilty on the spot <clears throat> and get beat with rods. Tremendous suffering. And then God sustains these two men, Paul and Silas, 
But I want you to know it's the power of God, right? It is definitely the power of God. It's not their power, but he sustains them through their faith, through their prayer of faith, through their praising God at midnight. And so they are, they are the ones being sustained, but they are involved in their own sustenance, if you will. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to work and to will for his good pleasure. That's happening in Paul and Silas. They're working out their salvation in fear and trembling because God's at work in them. So those were the first three today. We come then to number four on the list. And it is the power to rescue doomed sinners. And you can add this to the point through saved sinners. The fourth dimension or facet of the power of Christ is his power to rescue doomed sinners, damned sinners, through saved sinners. So I want to start in verse 25, read through verse 34 to cover this point. Acts chapter 16 then, beginning in verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house, and he took them that very hour of the night, and he washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house, and he set food before them, and rejoiced, and he rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So this is our fourth point then to rescue doomed sinners, damned sinners through saved sinners, in this case through, of course, Paul and Silas. If we go back to verse 25, we find that they had likely been praying and singing for hours, but now the, the story picks up. It's midnight when things are going to really begin to get interesting after uh, they've been in this prison for some time, we would imagine. And they're singing these praises, uh, hymns to God, likely hymns from our own hymn, hymnal called the Psalter, the Psalms. Hymns that they would have memorized as children, Jewish children. Hymns that they um, that was their, their lifeline, right? This is their lifeline to God, singing God's word back to him in praise in the hardest moments of life. Uh, like a Psalm 23 that we recited today, reciting that, singing that, putting your own melody to that in the hardest times of life. That's what they're doing. And the prisoners were listening to them. So even as they suffer, they recognize that they're missionaries. Even as they suffer, they recognize that they're evangelists. And God has sovereignly put them in this place. And God has orchestrated and arranged for them to be able to get the gospel to people that they would have never gotten the gospel to if they'd been free and on the outside. And so here we are as they're in this prison. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened the prison doors fly open and everyone's chains were unfastened. This may have mean that the, the, the chains were fastened to walls and they came loose from the walls that were shaken by this earthquake. Now you can't imagine this was a terrible place to exist and, and be. I mean, it, it, <laughs> prison's a terrible place, period, always, in all times. There, there's nothing pleasant about being in jail or prison, ever. But this is the first century Okay, this is 49 AD. Listen, when you were thrown in jail or prison in these days, if your friends or family didn't bring you food, you starved to death and no one cared. They didn't feed you. There wasn't clothing, medical care, food. There wasn't nice beds. There wasn't nice... 
accommodations. There were rats and there were lice and there were fleas and there was stench and there was human feces and there was no place to relieve yourself and there's no running water and, and, and you basically died there if no one from the outside could come and care for you. And that's the situation that this jailer sort of rules over. All right, so it's late at night. He's on duty, obviously, to guard this place. He's, he's awakened by the earthquake, verse 27, and he immediately sees somehow through some light, through some torch, something, there's some way that he's able to see that the doors have been thrown open. Now, he doesn't know how long they've been open. He doesn't know how long he's been asleep, right? He just knows he wakes up and the doors are open. So his first thought is everybody's gone. And if everybody's gone, he's a dead man. Uh, you, you died if you didn't keep your prisoners, that was the penalty for failing your job. And so he knows this and he would rather just handle it himself and get it over with. So he draws his sword and he's about to fall on his sword. He's about to kill himself because that's his certain outcome here. And he's, he's sure that the prisoner has escaped. And Paul, thinking quickly, cries out with a loud voice. Seeing, somehow Paul, seeing what is about to happen, screams out, do not harm yourself for we are all here, which is kind of a miracle itself. Why didn't they escape? Why hasn't every, their, their chains are loose. Why haven't they all made a run for it? Sovereignty of God, providence of God, Paul's leadership. We don't know why they haven't tried to make a run for it. They just haven't. Paul says, we're all here. Don't do that. He calls for lights. He rushes in. He's trembling with fear and he falls down before Paul and Silas. Now he knows something about Paul and Silas. He may have heard something of their praying and their singing as uh, the, the evening went on before he went to sleep. He may have heard the story about them casting out the spirit of divination, that these were men of God, the most high God with a proclamation of salvation. He may have heard rumors about that, but he doesn't know details. He doesn't really know what all that means. And so he comes in because he's, here's a man who was just mere seconds away from being dead. Right? You've been in that kind of car wreck, you know? What happens after you are in the wreck, but you lived or you survived and then you're, you start shaking, right? You start trembling because the whole event hits you and that's what's happened to this guy in verse 29. He's trembling, he's shaking, he realizes he was moments away from dying. He comes in with fear before Paul and Silas. He knows that there's some type of prophetic men of God. They represent some kind of God. And he brings them out of the inner prison now, verse 30. He didn't go into where they were. He brings them out, brings them to a different location. And he's fallen down before them. And he says to them, sirs, respectfully, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, we really have no idea what all he means by that question. We don't know that he understands this question as Christian salvation, forgiveness of sins, and all of that. He may only be thinking in terms of physical salvation. He may be thinking only in terms of how do I explain, you know, what happened to the jail, uh, the, 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 all the damage, all the destruction. We, we don't know what he means by saved, but it doesn't matter to Paul. <laughs> it's, it's Paul's open door. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, whatever you mean, we don't really care what you mean by the question. What you need to hear is this, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, folks, that's not the whole gospel. <clears throat> that's the end of the gospel. <laughs> uh, that's the last part of the gospel. The gospel is God, man, Christ, response. This is the response. This is not everything. This is Luke summarizing what happened in this event. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You will be rescued, you and your household. Trust in the Lord Jesus, not the Lord Caesar. <laughs> Trust in the Lord Jesus. We're going to give you a whole new paradigm shift of affections and passions in your life. And that passion is going to move from the Roman Empire to the empire of God through Jesus Christ. We're going to give you a cause to live for here. And it's not Lord Caesar, it's Lord Jesus. And if you will believe in him and trust in him and put your hope in him and not the Roman Empire, your employer, you will be saved. You will be rescued. And in fact, this promise is not just for you. It's for your household. It's for your wife. It's for your children. It's for your grandchildren. If you have them in this household, it's for your servants. If you happen to have slaves, it's for them as well. Why do I say this is not the whole gospel? Why do I say this is summarized? Because of verse 32. Look at verse 32. 
We often just think verse 31 is the gospel. We think if we say to somebody in a subway, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If we think we preach the gospel, we are woefully wrong. The gospel is not a bumper sticker. The gospel is not a, a, a short, simple sentence like that. That's part of the gospel. Because look at verse 32. They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. That could have been 30 minutes. That could have been an hour. That could have been Genesis 1, 2, 3, 12. No telling. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. No telling where Paul would have gone. Speaking the word of the Lord to him with everyone in the house. He took them that very hour. So he did believe. He did believe. He took them that very hour. He washed their wounds. Wow, what an incredible thing. This is a jailer. This is a former likely Roman soldier. He's likely possibly a slave that is owned by the city of Philippi. I mean, we had Lydia, the, uh, you know, the entrepreneur, seller of purple fabric. She's this part of society. We're down here at this unnamed Philippian jailer who's a retired Roman soldier who might even be a slave himself. With one of the lowest possible jobs you could ever have, right? And look at the immediate impact of him believing, washing their wounds, caring for them tenderly, kindly, generously. Immediately he was baptized, immersed in water to demonstrate he had put his faith in Christ, he with all his household. And then beyond that, he brought them out into his own house. It's way past midnight now. It's the middle of the night. And he set food before them. He put something together, fed them. They were all rejoicing. He would believed in God with his whole household. This is the power of Christ to rescue doomed sinners through saved sinners. And this is how he always rescues doomed sinners. Before Paul and company rolled into town, Mr. Jailer Man was doomed to spend eternity in a far worse prison than he oversaw as his job. Before he woke up and heard Paul's words, he was asleep in his own depravity. As a Roman soldier, can you imagine what he has done? Can you imagine what he has seen? As just a typical Roman Greek person, can you imagine the drunkenness of his life, the lust, the sexual immorality? How many wives has he possibly had? Can you imagine his train wreck of a life morally, spiritually up to this point in his life? And then the power of Christ, actually, obviously, way before these moments, the power of Christ was at work because Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. What did God do? Well, God sent Christ, first of all. God became a man, lived a perfect life, died an atoning death on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead and ascended back to heaven. That's the power of God. If that doesn't happen, this man has no hope. There's no salvation for him. There's no gospel for him if all of that hasn't happened. God did that first. And then God saved Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. <laughs> That's power. That's a lot of exercising of God's grace and saved them. And, and, then, and then he sends them from Antioch in Syria, way over to the east, all the way to Philippi. You know how far that is? Take a guess. Take a guess how far it is from Antioch to Philippi. 935 miles. That's how far these missionaries have come on a mission of mercy by foot and by sea. And then God arranged that the slave girl would be there, be, be uh, oppressed by this spirit of divination. God orchestrated all of that, arranged all of that, and, and that Paul would have this opportunity to cast out this demon in the power of Christ and and circumstantially, God oversaw that they would be arrested, right? They had to be arrested for this man to hear the gospel. It's all the sovereignty of God orchestrating like a giant chess match so that this man and his household could be saved. And, and then God sustained Paul and Silas after their terrible beating, giving them great joy, which you know had to make a huge impact on the jailer. I mean, he's, he's seen the victims of these beatings over the years, and nobody was acting like these two guys. And then God sent an earthquake, but not just any earthquake, a very precise earthquake to open the doors and loosen the chains, but not destroy the place. I don't think they built 
buildings back then earthquake proof, right? No, they didn't, no. <laughs> Ancient earthquakes leveled cities, hundreds of thousands of people at times killed. Here there's a great earthquake, shakes the whole place, it doesn't crumble to the ground and kill everybody inside. It just opens doors and loosens chains. <laughs> And then God kept the prisoners in place. And then God used Paul's quick thinking to prevent his suicide. All of that, all of that had to happen for this man to come to faith in Christ. The power of Christ is to rescue doomed sinners through saved sinners. Now, I said last week that Lydia represents the churched person, right? She was moral. She was a worshiper of God. She would represent for us the churched this man, unnamed to us, then represents the unchurched. We go from a God-fearer, a proselyte to Judaism, to a pagan, to a Roman jailer and former soldier. He represents God's power then to save the unchurched person. He represents God's power to save that man who is rough around the edges. Not refined like Lydia selling purple fabrics. This guy's like the army vet in the bar swapping war stories. And showing off scars. This is no Boy Scout. <laughs> this is not a person that had any interest in the Yahweh of Israel. And he represents to us that God, again, can save whomever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. This is the man who's never darkened the door of a church. <laughs> this is a man who is a manly man, right? Rough around the edges, retired military Believer, are you longing for the salvation of someone like this? Do you know someone like this in your life, in your family, in your circle? Someone just like this man who's salty, whose language is, crosses the lines, right? Perhaps they're retired military. Paul would have some advice for you this morning. Paul would have some encouragement for you this morning. Here it is. He would say, number one, pray. Pray to God that God would open his heart to respond. Pray, pray, pray. Number two, if you're dealing with an unchurched person that hasn't darkened the door of a church in their life, you need to be straightforward and crystal clear. I think that's why Luke summarizes the message for us the way he did in verse 31. You don't need to get into nuances. You don't need to get into deep theology. They are speaking this man's language. They are commanding him. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's pretty clear. That's pretty straightforward. Right? You, you don't try to get philosophical. You don't try to get excessively theological. Obviously, there's more to the message. We see that in verse 32. But I think Paul would say, here's my advice. When you're dealing with a person like the Philippian jailer, be straightforward, be bold, be to the point, be crystal clear. This is what former military like. <laughs> this is what they want to hear. This is what they respect. Directness, clarity, conviction. Sir, if you will believe in the Lord Jesus... You will be saved. That's the promise of God to you today. Paul's example then is to pray and unleash the lion called the gospel. I know many of you work in this community, and we have a lot of retired military in this community, blessed with the Veterans Hospital, of course. Some, some of our church people have worked there and still work there today. And so you have these kinds of people in your life and these kinds of opportunities through your day-to-day -day encounters. Perhaps some of you have a, have a father or father-in-law that fits this category. Paul would say to you, pray for them and then unleash the lion called the gospel. You don't have to defend the lion, just let him off the leash. <laughs> and the gospel is the power of God to salvation. All right, number five then. Number five is the rest of the chapter, and it's very intriguing, and it's very interesting, fascinating section that could be easily overlooked and missed. Number five is the power to protect baby Christians. Let's add a phrase now, if you're taking notes. Number five, the power to protect baby Christians through mature Christians. Because I want to just keep emphasizing that God does these things through human instruments. All right, so let's read 35 to 40 and see what is happening here. 
Now, when day came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer, the saved jailer, reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, not to the jailer, jailers is brother in Christ. Paul says to them, the policemen, the lictors, these are likely the men who beat them. Paul says to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly? Certainly not. Ain't happening. <laughs> Let them come themselves and bring us out. What? in the world is Paul doing? You can leave. No, we're not leaving. You're not going to beat us without a trial, violate our rights as Roman citizens, and then just ask us to quietly leave. That is not happening here. Woo, Paul, standing up to the Roman government of Philippi, which means he is standing up to the Roman Empire. He is standing up to the entire system and saying, I'm not going away quietly. The policeman reported these words to the chief magistrates, the city council. Look at this next line. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Oh, this is a massive, uh-oh. We have really, really messed up. And they came. Who's they? The city council. They sent the policemen. They got turned away. The city council comes to the prison. Most of them have probably never been there in their life. They came and they appealed to Paul and Silas. They begged Paul and Silas. They pleaded with Paul and Silas. And when they had brought them out, Paul's not, a, Paul's not that stubborn that he's just going to sit there forever and make them beg. No, he, he eventually they came out. They kept begging them to leave the city. Verse 40, they went out of the prison, Paul and Silas. They entered the house of Lydia, the first convert, who's obviously hosting the church now. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and they departed. So they eventually comply with both the request to come out of the prison and the request to leave town, but they did so on their own terms. They were begging them to leave right away, and they said, we'll leave when we're good and ready. First, we're going to go meet with the believers, and we're going to go encourage them because that's our highest priority, and then we'll make our way out of town. Beloved, this is the power of mature Christians to protect baby Christians. That's what's happening here. I've got to unpack this for you. This is an amazing passage. This is one of the most amazing passages so far in the book of Acts because it is so unknown what is actually going on here. Paul has now chosen this moment in time to assert his rights as a Roman citizen. He did not assert those rights while he was being beaten or before he was beaten. He could have. They could have screamed at the top of their lungs, waved their arms and said, hey, wait, stop everything. We're Roman citizens. How long does that take? We're Roman citizens. Everything would have stopped. The beating would have stopped instantly. It would have never started. They didn't say a word until after the beating, until after the prison event. What is going on here? Paul is waiting to assert his rights until it will have maximum impact. Whew. This is so wise. This is so godly. This is so loving. He is waiting to assert his right as a Roman citizen until it will provide the maximum protection for the infant church. Because by waiting until after the beating, Paul and Silas have a crime to hold over their heads. They were a victim of a crime by the city magistrates, by the city government, and they can now use that as leverage. Daryl Bach, in his commentary, explains it this way. He says, what happened to them was against Roman law. It's against Roman law to cane a Roman citizen. There were some exceptions that allowed it, but not without a full trial. This was not a full trial. The risk to the magistrates is significant, for part of their role as magistrates is to protect Romans from injustice. 
Paul's public release constituted an added element of protection for the local community, the local believers. The magistrates would be more careful in the future. He wouldn't write the book of Philippians for 12 years from this event. He bought them a significant amount of time of protection from persecution from the city government. He bought them with a beating on his own back for these baby believers. Lydia, her household, the slave girl, the jailer, his household. This was no small event. Paul talks about this beating in 1 Thessalonians 2.2. He refers to it as suffering when he came into Philippi. Suffering and a beating in Philippi. What we have here then in this final point, this final demonstration of the power of Christ through human instruments is we have an amazing Christ-like ability of Paul and Silas to consider others more important than themselves. An incredible sacrificial love for the greater good of others instead of their own rights being asserted. This is Christianity. This is spiritual leadership. This is godliness. This is what it means to love sacrificially. It was strategic. It was well thought out. And they held back those key words, I am a Roman citizen, until it would have the most protection. In fact, I see this as Paul demonstrating what he would write in Philippians 2. I want to just show you this real quick. Philippians 2. We're almost done. So we can go look at this in verse 3. You know this passage. Now you have an example of it from Paul and Silas. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Nothing. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Christ is the ultimate example. Paul and Silas are smaller examples of this very thing. Here then is the power of Christ protecting baby Christians through mature Christians. It causes us to step back and to ask ourselves this question, what are we willing to suffer? What are we willing to suffer for baby Christians? What are we willing to endure to protect a new Christian? What are you willing to put up with to help other people mature in the faith or to shield other people from abuse? Abuse like these magistrates could hand out. I would say to my fellow pastors and elders, this is spiritual leadership in action. What it means to be a spiritual leader is you're the one who takes the blows. You're the one, you're the lightning rod. You're the one that takes the false accusations. You're the one that takes the, the hits for the sake of those you lead. And that's what Paul and Silas are doing and demonstrating here for us. As God in human flesh, the risen Jesus is all powerful. I want to remind you this morning that nothing is too difficult for Jesus. In fact, nothing is difficult. Nothing. No person, no nation, no trial, election, economy, no demon, no problem, no place, no situation is outside his power. As the risen God man and the Messiah, he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Peter said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. We learn in Ephesians 1 that God seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Jesus Christ is now above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And God put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So what have we learned in Philippi? We have learned that Jesus has all power to open human hearts to the gospel through human messengers. We have learned that he has power to enable us to put on the armor of God and to stand firm in the gospel against the schemes of the devil. 
we have learned that he has the power to sustain suffering saints through their own prayers and praises. We have learned that he has the power to save doomed sinners through the straightforward gospel. And we have learned that he has the power to protect baby Christians through grown-up Christians. O oh, ye of little faith. O oh, ye of little faith. Will you believe today that Jesus has all power to accomplish in your life everything that you need? Will you believe today that he can be trusted implicitly with every detail of your life and everything that concerns you? Will you believe today that he can accomplish all of his holy will? And isn't that all you want? Isn't that all you want is all of his holy will in your life? And yet, as you think about Jesus having all power to meet every need of your life down to the smallest detail, when you think about that enormous, infinite power, I want you to remember and to recognize that it works through people. God uses means. And God's going to work His power through other people into your life, and He's going to use you as an instrument of His power in the life of others. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the unmitigated, absolute, sovereign power of Christ, the risen Christ. Thank you that the world belongs to you ultimately. It's all in your hands and we can trust you implicitly and totally, completely. Forgive us for our little faith. Forgive us for our anxieties. Forgive us for our carnal fears. Forgive us, Lord, for getting our eyes off of you and onto the problem, onto the world, onto ourselves. What a deadly trap that is. Help us to remember this passage, this sermon. Help us to remember these events in Philippi, from Lydia to Paul and Silas standing up to the Roman Empire all through your power. Help us, Lord, to trust you with everything. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.